This is an old exam problem. You have three beakers uh, filled with different le uh, liquids, and in all cases, the liquid is starts at the 25 milliliter mark. And remember, in all of these problems, that a milliliter is the same as a cubic centimeter, which is the same as a cc. In the uh, medical profession, they tend to use milliliter. Uh, in uh, science classes, we tend to use either centimeter cubed or cc. Now, we're told certain things about a ball and one of the things we're told is that when it's put in A, it sinks. Now because it sinks, it displaces an amount of liquid equal to its own volume. Where that ball is now, liquid A used to be. It got pushed out of the way. And we're told that the level in the beaker goes up to 40 milliliters. And that gives me my answer to our A. The volume of the ball is equal to the volume of liquid A displaced. And that's going to be 40 milliliters minus 25 milliliters or 15 milliliters. Now we're also told that when we lower the ball into liquid B's beaker, we find that it floats with two-thirds beneath the surface and one-third above the surface. And we're asked to find the mass of the ball. Now, when something floats, the mass of the ball is equal to the mass of the fluid, in this case, liquid B, displaced. This is only true if floating. Well, that ball is floating with two-thirds that's below the surface, and, and that two-thirds is what's displacing liquid. So I know that the volume of liquid B displaced is equal to two-thirds the volume of the ball. Well, that's going to be two-thirds times 15 centimeters cubed, or 10 centimeters cubed. Now, there's two ways to find the mass of the ball. One is to say, well, the mass of liquid B displaced is the density of liquid B times the volume of liquid B displaced. That's going to be 1.2 grams for every centimeter cubed times 10 centimeters cubed, or 12 grams. Now the other way to do it is to say, hey, let's use the iceberg approach. If two-thirds of that ball is submerged, that means that the density of the ball is going to be two-thirds of the density of the liquid. And I'm told that the liquid has a density of 1.2 grams per centimeter cubed. So that's going to be a density for the ball of 0.8 grams per centimeter cubed. Now, if I know the density, remember the density of the ball is just the mass of the ball divided by the volume of the ball. Well, if I did it this way, that would be 12 grams 
over 15 centimeters cubed, or 0.8 grams per centimeter cubed. If I went that approach, I would find the density first, and then I could go backwards to find the mass of the ball. Either way. Now, the next part of this asks us, will the ball float or sink in liquid C? Well, the density of the ball is less than the density of liquid uh, C, and so it is going to float. I didn't ask this on the exam where this was a question. I could have. What fraction of the ball will be submerged when it floats in liquid C? Tell your neighbor Nimrod how you would solve that problem. Okay, remember that if 90% if, if of the iceberg is invisible, is submerged, then the density of the ice is 90% that of the density of the liquid. Now I would write it in this situation as saying the density of the ball is equal to the density of the liquid times the fraction submerged. So if I want to know what fraction or what percentage is submerged, I would just solve this equation. The fraction submerged merged submerged submerged I can spell no I can't that's going to equal the density of the ball divided by the density, in, and this was uh, floating in liquid C, my mistake. So this is going to be 0.8 grams per centimeter cubed over 0.85 grams per centimeter cubed. And whatever that fraction is, that would be the percent that would be under the surface. Um, the last question asks, in which of these beakers, A or B, is the buoyant force the greatest? <clears throat> now this is the question that really tripped up a lot of people on the exam. And that's because if you're just focusing on uh, kind of a surface understanding, you're going to get tricked. Because you'll remember in class, we had a beaker of water. And in that beaker, we had a block of steel that was sunk to the bottom. And we had a block of wood that was floating on top. And we asked which one had the biggest buoyant force. And it was the steel, because it was displacing a whole lot, well, all of its volume was displacing water. Whereas the wood was only displacing an amount of water equal to half of its volume. So it had a smaller buoyant force. But in this example, the wood was in water, and the steel was in water. I was comparing apples to apples. This is displacing more water than that one is displacing water. Over here, this ball is displacing 15 milliliters of liquid A. And this one is displacing 10 milliliters of liquid B. That's apples and oranges. The buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced, not the cc's displaced, the weight. 
If I know it's the same water, I can look at the number of cc's and determine which one's going to displace more weight. But when they're different liquids, I can't do that. I don't know the density of A. Okay? It might be something with a very, very small density, in which case uh, I wouldn't have a very big buoyant force at all. What is the same in these two cases is not the liquid, but the ball. It's the ball in both cases. And here, the buoyant force is big enough to balance the weight of the ball all by its onesies. However big the weight of the ball is, that buoyant force is big enough to support it. If I draw a free body diagram for the ball when it's here, I have exactly the same weight. The Earth is pulling on it the same. But now there's two forces supporting that. There's the buoyant force, which is a little force, and there's a normal force by the bottom of the beaker. And those two together are supporting the weight. So that means the buoyant force is bigger in beaker B. Okay? Check that your neighbor got that right. If not, you know what to do. Do your duty. Smack them good. Folks, that's the end of uh, fluids. We're not going to discuss uh, sinking and floating until the uh, Friday before the exam when we go over a review, getting ready for the exam. So uh, if you have any questions, now would be the time to ask them uh, before we move on to the new topic. Any concerns, questions? Okay. We're going to start our discussion of rotation with a demo that I like to call the Wheel of Death. Now, I need uh, two volunteers, uh, large gentlemen, you two in the back, you're large enough to do this. Come on down. Yes, thanks for volunteering. We appreciate your service. Okay. I need one of you on either end of this uh, bar and uh, facing each other on either end of that bar. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin this up and I want you to lift it up out of its cradle here. So grab the bar and uh, get the bar up here, uh, up above the wheel. Now, when I get it going fast enough, I'll tell you to lift it up out of the cradle and then uh, we'll do that. If this were Harvard, I could do this with a machine, maybe grad student, but we're a poor school. Okay, so lift it up and out of the cradle. Okay, now, uh, I've got that wheel spinning, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off this rope and let go. Plan your life accordingly. You ready? Is that what you expected to happen? <laughs> that's called precession. That's called precession. And that's exactly why we left rotational mechanics till the end of the semester. There is an inherent goofiness that is involved anytime something is spinning. Now, I wish we had time for each of you to come up and try to turn this wheel in a particular direction. And what you find is it always goes in a direction 90 degrees to how you're trying to push it. It just inherently goes a different direction. And we're going to understand that. Let me help me get this back in the cradle here. Okay. Thank you. Let's give them a hand, folks. Now, no one ever died from that, that demo. It's actually just the wheel of serious injury. Uh, years ago, Jack Drumheller, he uh, recently passed away, but uh, not from this demo. Uh, he was a, a fantastic, wonderful uh, human being and also a wonderful physics professor, an excellent teacher. 
And for years, he was the provost here at MSU. And once when he was doing uh, the demo with this wheel, as he went to set it back in the cradle, he missed and it took off. And it just kind of started sliding across the table and he grabbed it. Unfortunately, this wheel is weighted down with lead to keep it uh, spinning and there was some blood involved. And so it's been called the wheel of serious injury ever since. Now, when I was alive, TV was not quite as exciting as it is today. Back in those days, it was black and white. And the most, the most hilarious, the most entertaining show of all back then was Candid Camera. You probably never heard of it. But essentially, they just put people in a goofy situation and they hide cameras and they laugh at them. And their most uh, famous episodes were the ones where they put a spinning wheel inside of a suitcase. And they walked up to the, uh, the registration desk in a hotel, they set down the suitcase, all the while this heavy wheel is spinning very fast. And then the bellboy comes and grabs the suitcase and goes to take it to the room. And as soon as he turns, the thing goes flying up and we laugh and we laugh. It's so easy to entertain us. Uh, that was before drugs. Uh, so, anyway, uh, that, that's one of the things that's going to make rotational dynamics a little more challenging than linear uh, dynamics. But we're, we're going to be able to uh, handle it. Uh, we're going to start, we're going to start very basic. Let me get this out of the way. I have two dots here, a red one and a blue one. I'm going to start them right there. I'm going to make the wheel go around once. And uh, what angle did the red dot and the blue dot just go through? 360 degrees. And we all know that that was 360 degrees. But the question is, why 360? Why not 277? Why not 183? I believe it's 360 degrees because my parents taught me it was 360 degrees and their parents taught them and it's just a matter of faith. But in truth, 360 is just a really easy number to work with. You can divide it by 12, you can divide it by 10, you can divide it by 8, you can divide it by all sorts of things you can divide 360 by. And so it's just a useful number. But it's not the number that nature wanted us to use. There's another measure of once around a circle that is just more natural. If I look at a circle, any circle, I get, um, regardless of radius, I get <coughs> the same number that keeps popping up. If I have two circles, one with a small radius, one with a large radius, their circumference is going to be 2 pi r in either case. If I take that circumference and I divide by the radius, I get this special number 2 pi, 6.28, for every single circle, big or small. And that screams out to me that that's what nature wants us to use when describing once around any circle. And it turns out that that's what you get if you measure your angle in radians. We say that once around is 360 degrees or 2 pi radians, 2 pi radians. Now here's how we define the radian. If I'm interested in giving a number to that angle, what I do is I come in and draw an arc length. Now what I would use would be a compass, not a Boy Scout, Girl Scout compass, but the kind of compass you don't run with, that's got points. Or sometimes it has one point and one uh, pencil, if you're in architecture class. 
And I would come out with that compass and I would draw an arc length. Now if I came out a distance r and drew an arc length s, if I came out twice as far and drew an arc length, it shouldn't surprise you that that arc length would be twice as long. And if I went out three times as far, it would be three times as long, and four times as far, four times as long. And so it doesn't matter whether I divide this arc length by this radial distance, or whether I divide this arc length by this radial distance, in either case, I will get the same number. I call that number theta, the angle between those two lines. That is the definition of the angle in radians. Now, think what you're going to get if this line is rotated all the way around and back up, so where it's parallel with that line. In that case, the arc length is going to be 2 pi r, and when I divide it by r, I'll get 2 pi radians. 2 pi radians. Now, on the first day of class, many of you had uh, your calculators set on radians instead of degrees, and we had to fix that or else you were going to get wrong answers on the first midterm. When it comes to rotational problems, it's radians that we want to use. Now, I'm not saying you should switch your calculator to radians. Whenever we're dealing with sines and cosines, we're going to want those calculators in degrees. But radians are going to be the way we solve rotational problems. I'll show you some examples in just a moment. Now, one radian I could find by going out one meter and making an arc length of one meter. <coughs> And that would be 1 over 1, or 1 radian. How many degrees would that be, 1 radian? 45. Anyone know? 45. I'm sorry? 45. 45? Nope. So 1 radian. Turns out it's a little less than 60. It's 57. And here's how I remember it. Right now I'm serving as a Boy Scout Scoutmaster. You can just look at me. I'm not qualified. But they, they asked me to anyway, so I couldn't say no. Anyway, suppose that we're out camping and it starts to rain. So we find a piece of sheet uh, plywood and uh, we set this up as a, as a lean-to. And we do it by uh, taking a one-meter stick and supporting the lean-to. Now, that stick is curved. Suppose that I were to grab that stick and just push on it till it was straight. What would that do to this angle? It would make it a little bigger, would it not? It would move the lean-to up a little bit. Now, if I got this one meter stick straight, then I would have an equilateral triangle. One meter, one meter, one meter. And I know that all the angles inside of an equilateral triangle are what? 60 degrees. So now, if I take that stick and let it relax, let it curve again, let the lean-to settle back down, it's going to be a little bit less than 60 degrees. Turns out it's 57 degrees. Now, another way of thinking of that is that there are uh, two pi radians in every once around, once around a circle. So that means two pi radians, six and change, has to fit in 360 degrees. Well, that means each radian is going to have to be a little bit less than a sixth of the degrees, or a little bit less than 60. Does that make sense? Okay, now I didn't have to use a one meter stick. I could have come out two meters and used a two meter stick. Either way, I'd have one radian there. Now, really quick with your clicker, how many radians are in 90 degrees? That's not hard. I think all of you are gonna get this right. Just check it. Is 
Not all of us? Good, the answer is B, pi halves. Now, some of you may have a, a button on your calculator that converts uh, degrees to radians. Uh, that's handy. If you don't, it's always easy to convert. If I start with 90 degrees, well, that's going to be equal to 90 degrees. That's obvious. And I can always multiply anything by 1 without changing it. But there's lots of ways to write the number 1. For example, 2 pi radians is once around a circle. So is 360 degrees. So 2 pi over 360 degrees is the number 1. Now I'm going to rearrange those so that it's clear what fraction of a circle I'm going around. I'm going around a quarter of a, of a circle. Now let's think in terms of Thanksgiving. If we have two pies and you get a quarter of all the pies, you're eating half a pie, are you not? Yeah. So now I'm hungry. Okay. Half a pie. Half a pie. Now, this is the type of question you'll need to answer on the final exam. <laughs> a box is fastened to a string that is wrapped around a pulley. The pulley has a radius of four meters. The pulley turns through an angle of 43 degrees during which it is dropping the block, the box. So how far does the box drop as the, the wheel turns by 43 degrees? So with your clicker, tell me what you get. Work it out with your neighbor and then use your clicker. Okay, if you haven't voted, get your clicker points. Okay, we're kind of all over the map here. And that's okay. Because this is a challenging, challenging problem. And I set you up. I made it more challenging than it had to be. Let's solve it together. First off, we need to recognize that in order, in order for that box to drop one inch, I have to let out one inch of, of line. Anyone that's been fishing knows that. And so that means as this wheel turns through 43 degrees, that arc length is going to be the distance we're looking for, the distance that the box drops. Now that arc length would be oh so simple to calculate if I had given you the angle in radians. But I purposely gave it to you in degrees 
to show you how complicated this can be if you are using the wrong units. If I had told you that 43 degrees is the same, exactly the same as 0.75 radians, now it's going to be simple to solve. I'm looking for the arc length, and uh, that arc length is part of the definition of the angle. So instead of S as the arc length, I would replace it as the distance D that the box drops. And then I solve for D. Well, D is just the radius of the wheel <coughs> times the angle in radians. Well, that's going to be 4 meters times 0.75 radians, and that's going to give me 3 meter radians. That means that the box drops 3 meter radians. Now, does that sound funny to you? I would like to say the box drops 3 meters, because a distance should be measured in meters. So why don't we just drop the radian? If we don't like something in physics, can we just erase it? It's the way some of us have been operating. It turns out that in this case, it's OK. <clears throat> because if I look at the definition of the radian, it's an arc length divided by a radius, which is a length. So the units here, radians, have to be the same as the units on the right-hand side of the equal sign. That's going to be meters for the arc length divided by meters for the radial distance. And that cancels out. So the radian doesn't have any actual units. It's a placeholder to remind us that we're talking about an angle. And so whenever it's inconvenient, we can just get rid of it. Or whenever we need it, we can just insert it. It's just a placeholder. Okay? Check with Nimrod. Check that your neighbor's okay with that. Okay, let's talk about something that moves. If I spin that wheel, which dot is moving fastest, the blue one or the red one? Well, if we're talking about linear motion, the blue one has to go around a bigger circle in the same amount of time that the, little, uh, the red one goes around a little circle. So linearly speaking, the blue one is traveling a lot faster. Now, we're going to define a new kind of velocity. It's not how far down the road you get each second. It's how far around in radians you get each second. Now, if I look at this wheel, because it's rigid, every part of the wheel goes around 2 pi radians in exactly the same amount of time. That means as far as the number of radians that are traversed in a second, I would have the same number of radians per second for the blue dot, the red dot, this point on the hub, this point on the rim. Every point on the wheel would have the same rotational velocity. Oh heck, I'm messing this up. I am not teaching this well. Let me turn it over to the master teacher, Calvin's dad. He can teach better than anyone else. Playing a record, I'll show you something interesting. A record is a big old CD out of plastic, okay? Compare a point on the label with a point on the record's outer edge. They both make a complete circle in the same amount of time, right? Yeah. But the point on the record's edge has to make a bigger circle in the same time, so it goes faster. See, two points on one disc move at two speeds, even though they both make the same revolutions per minute. That man can teach, okay? There is no possible way to say that any more clearer than that. And yet, the result is this. My point here is that 
some of you are going to come away from this week feeling like Calvin. Don't let that happen. It's not that hard. It really is a simple connection that we can make between linear motion and rotational motion. If you feel like Calvin, you need to talk to me, you need to talk to your TA, you need to go to the health center, you need to talk to someone. Because it's not hard. I promise, it's not hard. Now, let's talk about this angular velocity. We call it omega. We give it the Greek symbol ome omega. It's not a W. Okay? Now, the operational definition should look familiar. When we were talking about linear velocity, the magnitude was just how far you got down the road divided by how many seconds it took to get there. So, with angular motion, angular velocity, the magnitude, instead of how far down the road we get, it's how far around we get in radians, divided by how much time it takes. Now the difference, the big difference between these two equations is that if I start here, and I go to the right, and then I go to the left, and I come right back to my starting place, what's my delta x? Zero. Okay? But when we deal with angle, we don't zero it out each time we get back to our starting position. In other words, if I start here, that would be 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, 8 pi, 10 pi. I just keep on counting. I don't zero out. Okay? Now, this is the type of question that you have for homework, all three of your problems are a, well, actually, they're the same problem, just dressed up differently. They really are. On a wristwatch, one of the old style ones with a second hand, what is the angular velocity, magnitude, and direction of the second hand? Talk to Nimrod, see if Nimrod can solve this problem. Let's look at it together. The magnitude of this velocity is really quite easy to calculate. A second hand goes once around every minute. Well, we usually talk about what angle does it go through in one second. Well, if it goes through two pi radians once around in 60 seconds, and 2 pi is 6 and change, well, when you divide 6 by 60, you get about a tenth. So it's about a tenth of a radian per second. The hard part is the direction. Now, because we're talking about the second hand on a, a watch, I would like to say clockwise. Because, hey, if you can't say your clock is going clockwise, what is, right? But that brings up some special problems. What direction is that wheel spinning, Barrett? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise. What do you think, Elizabeth? Is he, uh, you got it right, or is he a lion sack of spin? Clockwise. Oh, clockwise. counterclockwise. Really depends on which side you're on. Now it turns out when you're using your wristwatch, you're always on the same side of the wristwatch. 
But as we saw in this wheel of serious injury, with many problems in rotation, it's impossible to stay on the same side of the problem because they're inherently three-dimensional. As this thing was processing around, we kept on finding ourselves on different sides of the wheel. And so we can't really use clockwise and counterclockwise to describe the direction of this angular velocity. Now, with linear velocity, we used a vector. And it was very simple to do. It was out our front windshield if we were going down the road in, uh, in a forward direction. If we were in reverse, it was out the back windshield. It was the direction we were going. Now the question is, how would I assign a vector to this rotation such that it would make sense? In other words, how could I represent this rotation right here such that I could just hand you a vector and that vector would tell you how to spin the wheel, how to orient the wheel and how to spin the wheel. Talk to Nimrod, see if you can come up with a way that you could use this vector to describe that rotation. Okay, the problem is that a vector cannot curve. I can't put a curved arrow and call it a vector. A vector only has one direction, and so it has to be straight. Now, if I try to use this vector to represent any part of the wheel, well, as the wheel turns, the direction's going to change. If I put it along the spokes, that direction is going to change. Every part of this wheel is changing direction as it goes round, except what? The middle. Except for the axis. Except for the axis. And that's how we define the direction of the omega vector, of the angular velocity vector, along the axis. It seems goofy, I know, but that's the only part of the wheel that's not changing direction. So if I were to say the omega vector points this way, you could line up the axis that way, and then you would know how the wheel was rotating. Now, here's a little bit of a wrinkle. It turns out that there's two ways to point along an axis, which is convenient because there's also two ways to rotate about any given axis. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to associate one direction along the axis with this rotation, and I'm going to associate the other direction along the axis with the other rotation. The question is, how to decide which one goes with which. Well, it turns out the decision was made many, many years ago by a group of dead white physicists, and it turns out that everyone in the room was right-handed. And so they came up with something called the right-hand rule. With the right-hand rule, what we do is we curl the fingers of our right hand in the direction the wheel is rotating. Our right thumb is pointing along the axis in the direction of the omega vector. So if I rotated it about the axis that way, I would have to use my right hand, rotate my fingers in the direction it's spinning, my thumb would now 